Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Atlantic Council. Um, my name is Jason Marzak, and I'm the director of the Latin America Economic Growth Initiative at the Adrian Arch Latin America Center. And uh, on behalf of our center, I'd like to thank you all for joining us here today for this discussion, uh, Latin America's infrastructure potential, uh, a missing key to improving trade. Uh, before we get started, feel free to enjoy the empanadas. We'll say they're Argentine empanadas in honor of the president, obviously being in, in, in Buenos Aires today. Um, and no, no, no difference, difference to my, my, my Panamanian and Colombian <laughs> colleagues here. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Japanese embassy for their partnership in putting this event together. Today is what we're doing. This is the first of what I hope will be many discussions about vital transport infrastructure and its implications for trade in the hemisphere. Now, this is new work for us. I'm sure that no one at this table has been to an infrastructure event put on by the Latin America Center. And it's expansion on the pillars that we've embodied as part of our center since we started the center in October of 2013. As many of you know, we oftentimes speak about the transformations in Latin America, the gains that the region has made in the last 15 years to bring millions in the middle class or to boost trade with the United States and Europe and Asia. Um, but with the recent slowdown, we can also look to the next chap to what else might sh shape the next chapter in Latin America's economic story, and much of that has to do with the potential for infrastructure. Um, throughout. You know, one, one thing that is consistently clear, though, is that the region's infrastructure, and particularly its transport infrastructure, needs improvement. The ability to move goods around the regions and around, around the region, around the world, will in many ways be the bellwether for sustained economic growth. And also the bellwether for increasing uh, the movement that we're starting to see across the region to a more outward-looking economic uh, model. Uh, in the next decade and for years to come, it will be crucial for the region to double down on its investment infrastructure. Um, this means maintaining and, and expanding uh, enormously positive assets such as the Panama Canal, uh, such as modern ports like in Cartagena, um, but it also will take steps in improving uh, feasibility for public-private partnerships and showing governments that infrastructure can be uh, an economic, social, and political boon. So we are thrilled, I'm thrilled to have an excellent uh, panel here today. Uh, couldn't think of, of four better people to have for this uh, kickoff discussion on, on infrastructure. And I will introduce our panelists as uh, going, going to, from, uh, from left to right here. To my immediate left is Giovanni uh, Benedetti. Giovanni is the commercial director at the Porta Cartagena where he negotiates major contracts with major shipping lines uh, throughout Europe, Latin America, Asia, and the United States. To, next to Giovanni is Marianela Dengo de Ovalia. Uh, she's the manager of strategic relations in the, uh, the management section of the Panama Canal Authority. Uh, she's held several major, ma uh, major managerial positions throughout the authority, including in the customer relations and marketing divisions. Um, and I'd first like to thank Giovanni and Marinella for coming up to Washington during Holy Week when, you're, when both of your countries are effectively shut down for the week. So we have to uh, make sure that you're having a, a fun time during what would otherwise be vacation for you. Uh, next to uh, Marinella is uh, Hajime Te Tekuchi. Hajime is the chief representative of the Japan International Cooperation Office, uh, excuse me, agency known as JICA uh, in the United States. He spent much of his career working for JICA in Latin America, where he not only has overseen official development of, uh, assistance, but also works on public-private partnerships. And then finally, at the, uh, next to uh, uh, Hajime uh, is Roger Libby. Roger is the Senior Director of Corporate Public Policy for DPDHL. Um, he has an extensive background in all things uh, transportation and infrastructure, including previously working at the uh, US Department of Transportation and the House of Representatives. Um, so I have, I have a number of questions for the panelists, and we're also going to try to keep this as fun and interesting as possible because this is a, a, a conversation on infrastructure, which is inherently a very interesting uh, a topic. And so throughout the conversation, we have a couple of videos or PowerPoints that have been keyed up to really illustrate some of the different points that we're going we're gonna to be talking about. Uh, but it's a round table. So I also, we're going to have formal time for questions at the end from everybody, both at, around the table as well as people who are sitting on the sides. But if you have a question, 
in, in the interim, while we're in the in the gauge and conversation on a, on a specific topic, raise your hand and 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 I will no, uh, note note that down and uh, and 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 get to your question. Um, you know, this is also, you know, we oftentimes do our events on a, on a, on a stage uh, with a theater style, so we want to keep this uh, more informal given the fact that we're around a, a table here. Uh, this is also being webcast, so if you're, if you're watching by webcast and you want to uh, tweet a question, you can tweet it using the hashtag ACTrade. Um, so I'm going to start off uh, with, with the first question, a very general question for some of our panelists. Uh, and, and that's about really the state of infrastructure today and how they see it from their unique pers perspectives uh, in, in the region. Uh, what are both some of the things that, some of the improvements that have been seen over the last few years? And what are some of the critical setbacks from their, their perspectives? Um, Marianella, you're, you're uh, somewhat in the center there. Yes. Uh, so I'd like to, to, to start off with you. From your perspective, from, you know, from a from a a, a port or, or non-port perspective, what have you seen as some of the the biggest challenges, and how how have you what, what have you seen so far as in a broad scale some of the steps that have been taken to uh, overcome some of those deficiencies, specifically in so far as on the on the commercial realm? Well, actually, um, <coughs> we have an expansion project that began back in two thousand and seven. It's a five point twenty five billion dollar project that is going to change the way goods move around the world. When we came up with this project, it was the first time that we got to be like face to face with many players in the US, mostly US ports. Uh, some of them had in the pipeline projects like for many, like for even 12 years, trying to get the approvals to get uh, the project uh, going. Approvals regarding, you know, environmental permits, approvals regarding funding. Mm -hmm. So those were the major blocks that we saw during this time. However, uh, we have seen uh, many improvements. When we came up with the project, for example, the only port in the U.S. East Coast that had a 50-feet draft, which is what we are going to be offering, uh, starting mid-year this year, was north for Virginia. Uh, now there is the port of, of Baltimore that have it. Uh, there is the port of Miami. And some people, like for example, the port of Savannah, they had been looking for funding and for approval for about 12 years when they first reached us. Uh, now they have the project approved and they are moving forward to have 47 uh, foot of draft uh, by year 2017. So we have seen, you know, uh, at the end, things have been moving forward. They have been changed. Uh, back in 2012, 2013, uh, President Obama came with the We Can't Wait initiative. And was, it was an initiative that was in response to the Panama Canal expansion. Mm -hmm. He was clear on the fact that additional capacity was needed in U.S. port if they wanted uh, these big ships calling on the ports. So we have seen a lot of improvement yeah. in that part. Uh, we have always been in touch with people uh, from the grain sector. Uh, for example, uh, about 40% of, of U.S. exports of grains, mostly soybeans, transit the Panama Canal, and they come all the way down the Mississippi River to the ports in the Gulf uh, to be sent uh, to Asia. Uh, we have been in touch with them. Uh, they are always trying to improve the infrastructure in terms of locks, dams in the Mississippi, and even uh, the draft, which is uh, like 45 uh, feet in Baton Rouge area. Uh, we know that now they are talking with the Corps of Engineers. So a lot, of, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of U.S. ports have, have, have they, are catching up to what's, what's going to be offered as part up, of they are the catching Panama up. Canal yes, expansion. that's right. Um, which, uh, well, I'll let you, I'll let you reveal. I won't, re I won't take the, the the wind from you, and I, I'll let you reveal the, the date later on of when the when we're <laughs> actually going to see the, the the inauguration of the new canal. But we'll get to that after okay. this first round. Okay? okay. We'll let everyone hold hold for a second on that one. Uh -huh. um, Giovanni, a well known fact, and President Santos talked about this when he was up in Washington in, in February, is that it's more expensive to ship from uh, Bogota to Barranquilla than it is from Barranquilla uh, to Hong Kong. 
Um, in the port's view, what kinds of improvements does Columbia's land transport infrastructure need to make in order to bring goods more easily, not only to port, but also from port more uh, broadly across the country? Thank you, Jason. Yeah, um, you have hit a very, very interesting point. Um, when we come to uh, the way and the nature that goods move through the world, uh, you need to analyze different perspectives. And a curious thing is that 80% uh, um, of the population worldwide normally lives about uh, 100 miles or so near the shoreline. In Colombia, it's the opposite. I mean, 80% of the population lives in the mountain. So it's like uh, Colombia <coughs> has uh, Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, but uh, I don't know. We have fear of the ocean, I guess. So we and, run and up into the mountains. And you have beautiful mountains. Yeah, yeah, they are beautiful. I mean, don't get me wrong. But uh, when we come to that perspective, and, and, and only to, to, to share with you, uh, it's not only about having good and efficient modern ports, because uh, um, what we have done in Cartagena through the past time has been re really awesome when you come to the figures. But uh, still, a single port won't change the uh, the economy of a country if it's not linked to its hinterland. So uh, to put it in perspective, uh, Cartagena to Bogota is about the same distance from uh, Veracruz to uh, Mexico City. Mm -hmm. But a truck from Veracruz to Mexico City will cost half of what it costs from Cartagena to Bogota. That's one's perspective. Now when we see also economical flows, uh, it's not only about distance. I mean, we always call it uh, economical distance or real geographical distance. I always say that uh, Shanghai is closer to Cartagena than is Bogota. Hmm. We can set a container from our industrial area from Cartagena into Shanghai to about $600 today. And it will cost about $2,000 to go to Bogota. Wow. So economically wow. speaking, Shanghai is closer to Cartagena industrial zone than a real country that is just That's there. Yeah. So there's a big a challenge in, uh, let's say, putting together all this internal connectivity in Colombia. We, we don't have a real railroad system, for example. Our uh, Magdalena River is not really working well, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of challenges also uh, into connecting all the dots. Mm -hmm. Connectivity, at the end of the day, is uh, what matters. Hajime, you've spent a lot of time um, in Latin America and the, the Caribbean. Uh, Giovanni mentions connectivity as being w one of the key uh, infrastructure uh, issues. Uh, Marinella about mentions you know the, the need for uh, approval of, of funding for for different expansion projects. Do you agree, or do you, do you what, what do you would you like to add something else to the discussion of what you've seen as some of the critical uh, improvements that need need to be made in on infrastructure? Yes. Uh well, thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. And I very much agree with the necessity of the connectivity. Uh, well, as you, some of you know, don't know about uh, JICA. JICA is the uh, agency of the Japanese uh, assistance. We are providing loan assistance, technical assistance, and grant assistance. And as Japanese, uh, we know the ne necessity or the importance of the connectivity. Uh, at the time when uh, Japan lose uh, World War II, uh, uh, to Tokyo was totally, Japan was devastated. At that time, Japan and borrowed uh, 31 projects, uh, 31 loans uh, from the World Bank, and about one third of that loan goes to the transportation. And uh, it, is, um, it is for the construction of the Shinkansen bullet train or the highway network between Tokyo and Osaka. Osaka is the second largest city in, in Japan. And later on, this uh, connect, connection between Tokyo and Osaka will become very much important part of the development of Japan. So since then, uh, we Japanese are very much focusing on the, on the development of the infrastructure. And when it comes to the loan assistance or grant assistance, our job, we also focused for the development of the infrastructure. And I understand that about one third of the total cumulative amount of the loan assistance goes to the transportation sector all over the world. So in that sense, I think we Japanese, as a kind of experience of ourselves, know the necessity of the connectivity. And when it comes to the finance, uh, in the world of the uh, development assistance, recently the issue is how to finance uh, the necessary uh, infrastructure. Infra lack of the infrastructure is really the issue now, not only Africa, but also all over the world. Not only for the trade, for, but the development itself, the infrastructure is a key. It's a kind of 
common understanding recently, and how to finance it. Not only, uh, not only from the uh, development assistance agencies like the World Bank or the IDB is not enough for that funding, and our financing is far much less, so it's not enough. So the issue is how to uh, mobilize the private investment or private finance. And so in that sense, it is quite, quite important. And so mm -hmm. in that sense, our role is changing, not just to directly finance the project, but to catalyze uh, the financial flow of the private sector. Okay, so I think so fun, the need for funding, the need for connectivity, and the need for mobilizing uh, private, fi private finance and working with entities on that. Um, Roger, you, um, you, your work, Roger's work, you're largely focused on, on, on Mexico, but um, let's look at Mexico and perhaps in comparison to some other countries in the region. What are some of the, I would like to ask you what you see as some of the biggest impediments uh, in moving products to market. And as Roger answers that, Roger has a very quick few slides that we're going we're gonna to put up um, as Roger answers that question insofar as the... Uh, <laughs> Um, the, uh, the biggest impediments. You should have a clicker right there. Thank you, Jason, yeah. and, and thank you to the Atlantic Council for having me and for having this event. I think it's very helpful. Uh, first of all, Deutsche Post DHL, DPDHL, is the world's leading logistics provider with 220 countries and territories and some 480,000 employees. So we're everywhere you want to be in a bunch of places you don't. Um, but when you look in the Americas, we really have four main divisions that are there. We have a supply chain division, warehousing, contract logistics, uh, and supply chain management. E-commerce, which is helping for the two to five day, uh, oftentimes tied to mail networks, but guaranteed controlled delivery for e-commerce driven. Heavy freight forwarding, which, rely, which will and does rely very heavily on the Panama Canal and the Port of Cartagena uh, for heavy freight, both air and ocean. Uh, and then DHL Express, which is the company that most people think of, the yellow trucks driving around town. Within Mexico, though, of that 480,000, we actually have just around 15,000 employees in Mexico. And this is a major strategic investment for us, both in terms of people and in terms of dollars and network, because Mexico itself plays a key role in connecting into the largest consumer network here in the United States. And a couple of ideas to, to put in mind the, the scale of DHL in the country. We have 80 supply chain facilities, which most of which are designated there, across Mexico, with a total of around 10 million square feet of warehouse space. We have six express gateways with 55 stations, 1,800 vehicles driving on 300 land routes. That means every single day you have roughly 22 flights, 120,000 kilometers being driven, and 110,000 shipments. Last year, it totaled 25 million uh, express packages uh, for 22,000 customers. And they're able to serve all of Mexico, or 98.5% of Mexico with next day service, the only provider to do that. The reason I wanted to give you that backdrop is to think, what could be an impediment to a company who's got such an expansive network, who has all the vehicles and all the fleet and all the resources to try to move? And the answer is simple. Infrastructure. We don't control infrastructure. We are relying upon local communities. We can control our own network infrastructure, but the rest of it is where we can face the burdens. I like to break infrastructure into three parts, and I, and I appreciate you letting me do this to help frame this conversation on infrastructure. Most of the time, people think about physical infrastructure. You're thinking, as we talked, maritime ports, but you're thinking roads and bridges. And US-Mexico border, a good example to think of this, the Laredo to Nuevo Laredo Bridge has 40% of all cargo trade between the US and Mexico by volume on that one bridge. That's uh, uh, 12,000 containers every day. Part of that is driven by the fact that rail lines are not allowed to operate from one country into the other, so they move up to the border, they offload all the rail cargo, they move it across the border, they reload it under an air, onto a rail line on the other side, and they continue to operate. Incredibly inefficient. Good efficiency right there. But that's an example where that bridge, that one bridge on the southern border of the U.S., similar to the ambassador bridge between the U.S. and Canada, if that one bridge were to collapse because of failed maintenance, the impact on the U.S. economy would be substantial. The next part of that, of course, is it's not just about road and rail. It's about seaports and airports. We're hearing a lot about seaports. I'll 
leave a little bit of the excitement about what Seaport's offered to the other panelists, but they're a critical component for moving goods, particularly by volume. But when you think of goods by value, that new announcement about the next iPhone, those are largely being moved by air because they provide time, just-in-time delivery, secured networks, and you're able to move a lot of the goods by value um, across in an aviation network. And that requires investments not just in the airport infrastructure, but also in the intermodal connection. How are you getting to and from that airport? You're looking at roads, you're looking at rail, you're looking at uh, the actual physical connectors as well. Um, and then the third part of it is the uh, customs clearance facilities. If you're dealing, in, as you said, on trade, you want to move goods. The last thing you want to do is to move a good, in the case of Brazil, you can bring it all the way to the border. You can get there more efficiently thanks to the new Panama Canal. You take it off the boat and it can sit there for three weeks waiting to clear. That's not the kind of efficiency you want. That's not being driven by physical infrastructure. That's on how they use the infrastructure they have. And looking at optimization here is a key and trying to find ways where you can um, pull as much of the clearance process away from the border as much as you physically work on the border. So there's federal investments oftentimes. I just point out one thing that we've done uh, recently in the last few years in the US that's different is they allow for, thanks to the US appropriations bills, local dollars raised in El Paso, Laredo, San Diego to be used on customs clearance infrastructure and staffing so that we don't just have the, the local impacts of delays are on the community there, although they may be felt commercially elsewhere. But they're willing to invest their dollars, but they'd previously been prohibited. So trying to bring in those dollars on the physical infrastructure side, um, and then also how you use it. Um, as I said, land borders is about 67% of all US-Mexico trade is by land border. But when you look at the value of the goods, it's different. Um, I'll wrap up the other that's, that's, side more quickly. That's physical. The next part is IT. How do we deal with the IT systems? Make sure that the uh, systems that doing customs clearance talk to each other. US has the ACE automated customs environment and, uh, and the Mexican single window as well. And how to make those systems both deployed uh, and interactive. And then looking at how cities themselves along that border can use IT systems for their own planning. Um, Costs can be in the millions to $40 million just on carrier savings. And the third part is this, is this usage and how you optimize that. Um, looking at that very quickly, harmonizing trusted trader programs, this is risk targeting. You don't need to stop every single package. Look for where you have the highest potential for risk, whether in terms of security or commercial. Um, you're gonna try to reduce the paperwork. Uh, if you, the US just passed a customs reauthorization with an $800 de minimis, that means goods below $800 can clear without customs fees. Mexico is at $50. It's not the worst. The Philippines is about 22 cents. Um, but that way you can move goods clearly without having to stop them just for customs paperwork. Um, I think that's a great, I think, I and, think and all that's, of these pieces, great, great over, yeah. just point out the pre-inspection, this is one that you had also raised um, in a previous discussion. This is an ability, it's a simple move, but it allows US customs officers to carry their firearms and go into Mexico to do pre-inspection and pre-clearance in Mexico. This just takes it away from the border, so you're not physically slowing down the goods yeah. at that border. Yeah, it was, a, it was a huge achievement when that was announced, I believe last fall that was yep. announced. Um, thank you, I mean, I think, so you know, Roger, you bring up an, a couple extra critical points, um, customs issues, I mean, we think about infrastructure and we think solely about you know, the, the physical aspects of, infra of, of connecting infrastructure, but you can have the best infrastructure, you don't, you don't have custom processes, then that's a huge uh, issue, and, and I see Marlonella raising, nodding her head there. Uh, Giovanni, switching back to, to, to Cartagena, it's one of the busiest container ports in the region. Could you speak, I was personally, I was telling Giovanni, I was impressed I was there two years ago and had a tour of the port and uh, saw every, every piece of cargo in that port is connected uh, technologically to basically a, this, this um, um, immense control center um, that looked like you could be stepping into a war room which, um, with, with, and the precision which, which the, the port knows where every product is at different moments. Can you talk a little bit about what different, what, what some, why the port has made some of these improvements over the last few years, and then what also what differentiates the port uh, from others across the region? Okay, Jason. Um, 
back in uh, the 90s, uh, the port throughput was really, really small. And actually, the trade of Colombia was very <coughs> small. So uh, when, when I was talking about that connectivity is the key, one of the main issues that uh, we were thinking is that it will, if we wanted to provide something extra to Colombian economy was to provide a good network. So in essence, we've been building Cartagena to be a huge hub today. And being a hub is much different than being a gateway port. So today, about 75% um, of the 2.6 million <laughs> containers we do per year are actually containers that has nothing to do with Colombia. And uh, they are connecting, as, uh, as Roger was saying, uh, the key is to, to, to have express connectivity. So we're mm -hmm. receiving containers from Australia via Cartagena going to Houston or from uh, Brazil via Cartagena going to uh, Central America. And some of these connections are actually taking hours. I mean, try to think a port like an airport. Mm -hmm. You're jumping from a vessel going to another vessel. To run these systems, uh, technology is key. So. Um, Believe me, uh, we always say that the difference between cargo and people is that uh, w w when you have a problem, you'll go there screaming to the airline. Mm -hmm. People leaving a container behind, some people will be screaming as well. Yeah. There's a commercial guy saying, where's my cargo? I want my cargo to do tomorrow. So uh, we have put a lot of effort in ensuring that uh, any container between a period of uh, 18 hours will connect and reach their final destination. That has been the key to our success, I would say. So no container, no container stays within the port for more than 18 hours? No, no, no. I mean, at least we will ensure that if you have a really tight connection, it will connect. So uh, that, that typically connect that, I mean, average connection will take about three days, mm -hmm. average. But uh, so for example, the banana trade, uh, this is shelf life of the product. We receive banana, let's say, from Costa Rica or from other ports in Colombia or fruits from Chile. You cannot leave a container of fruit sitting behind seven days, 10 days. Right. You're taking shelf life away. So we need to ensure also that all these type of products will have uh, their shelf life uh, one day reaches their market in, in Russia, in Japan, wherever it takes it. So Mariano, I'd like to, the, the, your, your moment to reveal the, 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 the dates <laughs> in which the, the expanded canal will, will, be, will be opening. And, and, after, and after you do that, you have a, uh, I want to show a little video that I think people will find really cool to see how, um, how uh, uh, the, uh, the process has been for the uh, canal's expansion. But maybe you Thank can you. give a little overview of where, where we're, what, what that's looking like as we approach that date, and then we'll go to the vid your video. Of course. Today was a very special day in Panama, a very special day for all of us who work at the Panama Canal. For several months and years, everybody is popping the question, and the question is when? Well, the date will be June 26th of this year. We will be inaugurating the expanded canal, and we will be opening it for commercial service. Uh, this project has taken almost nine years. It has had its ups and downs, as probably you have seen. Ups and downs that are usually related to construction projects, but it's very important for Panama because it will enhance our connectivity, and that's what you have been talking about, on our role as a transportation and logistics hub for the Americas. For the US, it is also significant. I just want you to know that 70% of the cargo that transits the canal has an origin or a destination in a US port. Oh. I don't know if you want to go ahead yeah. with the video. What, what? The video is, is very recent, and it's about this stage at, uh, that we are 97% we are complete as of, of today. Let, let, let's, let's check it out and see where, see, see where we are. OK. The opening of the expanded canal in 2016 marks the culmination of several years of efforts. The third set of locks project, the most complex component of the expansion program, is coming to an end, while keeping up the pace during the testing phase. The process to insert the 16 rolling gates in the respective lockheads at Cocoli and Agua Clara locks started in December 2014 and finished in April 2015. 152 valves that will control the flow of water in the chambers of both structures were also installed. After flooding all LOX chambers, gate commissioning tests were started. The first movement test was conducted on gate number 8 in Agua Clara, continuing with the remaining gates. Once construction of the water-saving basins is completed, basins will be filled up and functional tests will be performed. 
Water saving basins reduce consumption of water by 7% in each lockage as compared with the existing locks. Excavators were used to remove the plugs, which kept the waters of the oceans in Gatun Lake out of the construction sites, and the remaining material was removed through dredging. The construction of machinery rooms and control buildings is ongoing. The volume of concrete that has been poured reached the goal of 4.4 million cubic meters. Also, the integration of multiple locks process control systems is being conducted to ensure the efficiency and competitiveness of the Panama Canal. Three dams were built on the Pacific side, on the north side of the project, to keep the water level required to form the new north approach channel of the Cocoli locks. The Borinquen 1E dam lies a few meters ahead on the east side of Pedro Miguel locks. This 2.3 kilometer long dam separates the current navigational channel from the new channel of the expanded canal, which is 9 meters above Miraflores Lakes level. The new 6.1 kilometer long channel requires the removal of approximately 50 million cubic meters of material. Final phase of this project calls for the removal of the north plug through dredging and blasting activities to allow a direct access to Culebra Cut and Gatun Lake. After intensive dredging works to deepen the navigational channel of Culebra Cut, the historic 13-kilometer-long strip of land that crosses the Continental Divide is ready for Neo Panamax vessels. A similar task was carried out in Gatun Lake, where the navigational channel was deepened and widened using internal resources. Gatun Lake will be raised 45 centimeters to its maximum operating level to improve the water supply for the operation of the expanded canal. The project will add 200 million cubic meters to the water storage capacity. 33 range towers have been installed along canal banks to ensure the safe navigation of Neo Panamax vessels. These range towers will replace the signals and lighthouses that until now have been in operation at the waterway. The implement. Well, can you? Can you? Um, it's utterly impressive. I think that for anybody who hasn't seen the canal and how the canal works and what the what the process has been in expanding it, uh, um, it uh, it's the, the video does a great job of explaining that. Can you, Mario? What have been? There's, there's obviously been a lot of questions about, you know, the delays and and, yes. and, and moving this forward. Can you, um, talk a little bit about, you know, why why those delays ha w came about, and then also, uh, what the authority has done to, um, uh, to to get around some of the different challenges that were presented al along the way. And obviously, any kind of immense construction project like that is never going to go exactly ac according to, to plan. Yes. Uh, well, actually, um, probably you had read it in the news uh, for several years. Uh, the main contractor, uh, they were having some financial difficulties. We were able to uh, negotiate with them and to provide some cash influx to the contract. In addition to that, you know, it happened what happens in probably all construction programs. That, uh, uh, suddenly, the workers, they want to pay raise, and they decide you know, to do a work stoppage. Mm -hmm. And those are days that we are losing. And that happened during the period in which the contractor could be working faster, which is the dry season in Panama. In Panama, it rains uh, nine months a year, basically from late uh, March to no, uh, November and December. And this uh, shutdown of operations on part of the laborers, uh, that happened in January, mm -hmm. which is a very important uh, month for us as they could go faster. Uh, the last uh, delay uh, was caused by a problem with uh, the some of the that happened in some of the seals of the gates uh, that moved the completion date uh, from at uh, the opening of operations from April to June. The contractor was able to fix it, and they did all the repair work. We did all the testing. We contracted independent consultants to make sure that everything was working as expected. As you can imagine, if we are investing $5 billion, we need a project that is safe, 
that is reliable, that is going to be able to last at least 100 years. And we just uh, finished that stage. And that's why now we are ready uh, with the date for opening, which is June 26. And as we were talking about before, you already have a lot of companies that have already started um, putting their reservations in to start selling uh, We their will ships be, through. okay, we, we have many customers who are interested in deploying their ships through the Panama Canal. Uh, we will be opening a period uh, for reservations. We haven't done it so. Uh, usually they need about three months, so we will be doing it uh, probably in the coming weeks. And, uh, uh, but we have a lot of interest from our main customers, which are the container sector, and also from customers from the LNG sector. Uh, actually, when we came up with this project in 2006, we were not doing, the, the studies didn't point out to a uh, trade of LNG through mm -hmm. the Panama Canal. Now with the U.S. Uh, oil shell revolution that took place in the U.S., uh, the fracking technology that helped extract uh, the shale gas uh, in the Gulf area, we are seeing a potential, and uh, we are seeing that LNG ships will be transiting the Panama Canal probably by 2016, 2017. There are a lot of exports that will be going from the Gulf region to Asia, primarily uh, South Korea, and to Japan, and by year 2020, we expect to have about 25 million tons, uh, wow. metric tons, wow. Wow. cubic meters. I'm sorry, of LNG transiting uh, the waterway. Ro Roger, obviously, DHL doesn't 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 ship any LNG, but <laughs> how, how how does the uh, uh, Panama Canal, how's the canal expansion? How do you see that affecting your business? Well, I think the Panama Canal expansion affects us in probably multiple ways. First and foremost, our heavy freight division, while we don't uh, own or operate boats, uh, we do put a lot of maritime cargo into the network. Our heavy freight does both air freight and ocean freight. So we're moving a lot of goods for customers by ocean freight and being able to get more efficient time and lower cost uh, from the larger vessels is absolutely going to have an impact. The second is going to be the fact that this um, this port expansion, as, as you discussed, has not just affected what's happening in Panama or in Latin America, but the entire eastern seaboard of the United States is Ports try to get ready to take on the larger vessels. And so for us, that'll be affecting how we are connecting for our particularly heavy freight or supply chain customers in the US or in other ports uh, in Europe that might have uh, goods being transshipped through the canal um, so that they can get to market. So those ports infrastructure are having to adapt. So mm -hmm. it's going to affect us both in our own goods moving and also in our customers who are going to rely upon that. Yeah. And Hajime, from, from a Japanese perspective, obviously Japan's a, a world leader in, in transport to infrastructure, both the commercial and passenger sectors. From, from your perspective, how, how is I mean, this, the uh, expanded canal, which we've been waiting for for many years and is revol going to revolutionize uh, 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 trade? From your perspective, how, um, how, how do you see those, the, the advancements of the canal being affecting not only trade within the region, but as Roger points out, trade with, with Japan and with, with Asia more broadly. Yes, so uh, I'm not an expert of the maritime, com, uh, maritime uh, shipment or uh, uh, the cargo movement, but uh, well, obviously one of the major trading country from Japan is Brazil. And from Brazil, uh, the closest way is to go through Panama. Otherwise, you have to go all the way down. And uh, uh, until now, I mean, only the Panamax size uh, ship can pass Panama, Panama Canal. And if it become widened, uh, I, uh, it will be a great uh, impact for the uh, business to uh, Japanese companies. And also, uh, where many of the demand is, uh, of the United States is in the East Coast side. And right now, I understand many of the shipment goes to the West Coast and then uh, turn it into the truck or some other cargo facility, go to the East Coast. If it goes directly to the East Coast, it, is, it also facilitates uh, the movement of the cargo. So uh, yeah, without doubt that the uh, expansion of the Panama Canal, uh, we have a great impact for the Japanese business. And when we talk about the canal's expansion, um, obviously there's, this ex there's, there's obviously the need, Giovanni, for, for, for ports to, to be updated. This has been, a, a, a Roger brought this up before with regard to, to US ports. Um, but I'd like to ask you what, um, what the Port of Cartagena has, has done to prepare for these post-Panamax ships. And, and I know, um, 
you also because I uh, you also have a video that will show a little bit about how the port to Cartagena works insofar as moving products quickly from around the port and off, off of ships. And so maybe we could take a moment and show that first. Let me give you just one point and then we can Perfect. show you the video. Yeah, uh, indeed, the uh, Panama Canal uh, will first of all uh, bring a change in the network patterns. Uh, what will this mean? For example, for us being in Colombia, we always say that the new Pacific port of Colombia will be Cartagena. We're in the Atlantic Ocean, we're not in the Pacific, but since the network will change, I mean, you'll see much more uh, uh, volumes going also from the uh, west coast of US to the shifting to the east coast of US. This, this will mean that uh, carriers can do what they call double dipping. You can come from, let's say, Japan, Korea, <coughs> China, go to Panama, Atlantic, or Cartagena, reload and unload for the region, reload through the U.S. East Coast, come back. So you can use that vessel four times instead of only two, going only trans-Pacific. <laughs> so indeed, this, this, this will bring a lot of a new, let's say, uh, hubbing opportunities. We, from now on, we're doing about 2.6 million TEUs. We will we'll believe that we will jump to about uh, 4 million containers per year, only because the new networks will, will follow. Mm -hmm. And it is supposed, it is supposed. Currently, uh, freight rates are really irrational, but uh, in the way that you employ typically larger vessels, you get economies of scale. So you can, at the end, typically will encounter uh, better freight rates for your economies. But today, that doesn't mm -hmm. work. <laughs> and as we were saying before, you, you don't want your ships to be too large, though. Then you, you lose the economy of scale. You'll need to follow up with, a, I mean, very, very high productivity. You cannot just bring a, uh, having Big vessels, of course, they are beautiful, they are amazing, they're impressive, <laughs> but uh, you want uh, them to work uh, uh, easily, fast, and turn them around quickly. If you don't have the land back to support that, then you're doing nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, economies of scale and infrastructure make sense if you can transfer economy to something. Yeah. It's not only about looking beautiful and yeah. being impressive. Well, let's take a moment and look. I, I, I was very impressed when I saw it firsthand a couple of years ago. Let's look firsthand at the at the, the Port of Cartagena, how it works. And, and also, feel free, there are more empanadas out there. So if, so if you want to get up from the table and grab some more empanadas, uh, none of the panels will be offended. And don't get scared with the first part of the video. is only the make of how it took only 23 years ago. <laughs> it's really horrible. Video quality too. It's I, I didn't see any of this. Of course. <laughs> but we want you to remember how it looks. Yeah. The cafeteria. The strategic importance of the Caribbean is found in its plentiful resources, beauty, and sea trade lanes. This region has been the main crossroads of the Americas for more than 500 years. <sighs> Cartagena, located on Colombia's north coast, is a well-known world heritage and one of the most important cities of the region. Cartagena is considered the gateway to Colombia and currently is home to Colombia's major industrial expansions and developments. Through its port, multiple goods are shipped to many countries and regions worldwide. Today, the port of Cartagena handles over 40 million tons of cargo per year and is the most efficient and productive port of the Caribbean Basin and the only Colombian port with specialized terminals for container handling. As a matter of fact, due to its efficiency and exceptional location, six of the most important shipping lanes worldwide have chosen it as its transshipment hub for the Americas. The Port of Cartagena, committed to international trade, has forged a productive and efficient work team, which constitutes an outstanding element of its maritime terminals, thanks to which 
It has been designated on six opportunities by the Caribbean Shipping Association as the best port of the Caribbean. Based on the technological innovation and a wide range of highly valued services, more than 30 different shipping lanes currently call its port, offering sailings to more than 595 ports in 136 countries. Contecar Terminal, a $660 million state-of-the-art container terminal, is being developed in order to provide the very best service to the largest and most modern container ships as soon as they start crossing the expanded Panama Canal, connecting easier and faster to Asia. Contecar will be by far the best choice as a maritime transshipment center, a great hub with the capacity to assist ships capable of carrying 14,000 containers, which connect Asia and America with its faster services, higher frequencies, greater economies of scale, and lower freight rates. The efficiency, dynamics, and impact of its container terminals, with a combined capacity of up to 5.2 million TEUs, turns Cartagena into the logistic platform of the Caribbean. A place where productivity promotes trade and industry, encouraging competitiveness in the world market. With its direct sailings, lower transit times, best freight rates, and great connectivity, the port of Cartagena is a milestone for doing business and investing in Latin America and the Caribbean. The port of Cartagena is placed among the most efficient ports of the world, offering the highest standards of security and quality in its port services. And it is, without doubt, a privileged place which makes Latin America a more competitive and better integrated region within global commerce. Cartagena, Gateway to America. Impressive video. Um, the question for, for Giovanni or Mariano, Roger, uh, anybody, um, uh, Hajimi as well. When we look at the expanded canal, and I, I want to move from the canal and ports after this question uh, to look at public-private partnerships. Um, and again, if you have anyone's questions while we're doing it, we're going to open up for formal questions from the audience at the end. But if you have if you have questions as we're talking through some of these subjects, just raise your hand, and I want to make sure to include you in the discussion. Then I'm going to ask my question, and then, sir, I'll get to your question right after that. Uh, so my question is, what, what, are U.S. ports ready for this? Um, which, you know, this, is, this has been a, an, an, a, 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 a topic of discussion among uh, those who, who follow infrastructure here. Is that, is that the, these post-Panamax post ships, that the US, many U.S. ports are, might not simply be deep enough to be able to handle those ports? There's a concern raised a few years ago. Are, are ports ready, especially on the eastern seaboard, to be able to handle, or, or does some ports maybe risk uh, losing business? Is a question for for okay. any, anybody. Okay, um, uh, uh, let me start. Uh, actually, these ports are already receiving cargo in bigger ships that is coming via Suez Canal. Yeah, okay. Uh, we have, for example, you can have like maybe Charleston, Savannah, uh, receiving ships of about 6,000 to 9,000 TEU uh, in capacity, not full, of course. Uh, the way that we see that this is going to work is that we believe that there is going to be a change in patterns. And that instead of calling, uh, having a ship of 4,400 TUs calling several ports in the US, they will call fewer ports. Mm -hmm. Fewer ports in which they will be leaving larger cargo loads. And that's where the challenge is. Uh, as I, I told you, Norfolk is ready. Uh, and the other ports are really shooting for a date between 2017 and 2019. For example, uh, Charleston, I know they have a 45 feet draft, but with the tide, they can get to 47. 47 draft is perfect for a container ship. So uh, I would say that some of them are mm -hmm. ready. Uh, what is interesting is that what all our customers tell us is that it will not be until the New York, New Jersey, 
uh, Port Authority completes the Bayon Bridge uh, project, which they are elevating the bridge to 215 feet. Because the ships need to go under the bridge. They to have to, the to go under the bridge. Mm -hmm. When they complete that, then we will be able to see ships of about 12,000 TEUs going via Panama. Yeah. And what about so actually, it's New York, New Jersey, the one who will be calling the shots in the next huh. few months and years. Sounds very similar to a lot of, a lot of things. Um, uh -huh. it, how about Latin America? Are, are, Latin, are, there, are your, some of your, your competitors throughout the region? And, and, and uh, for Giovanni and Roger, I know you follow these issues pretty well. So either one of you, uh, are, are, are ports outside the US ready? Uh, I will say that uh, Caribbean-wise, uh, Jamaica, Kingston, Jamaica is another hub. They, they still need to follow a lot of uh, investments, especially in dredging and uh, acquisition of new cranes and equipment. Uh, Caucero and DR is also having uh, to expand. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have kind of a problem within their shareholders to, to put and raise the capital together. Uh, Panama, I know Panama, Atlantic side, uh, they are working on it. I don't know. I have uh, spoken to Carlos Uriola in a few days, but uh, I know that he's progressing on it. Yeah. He should be ready soon, I guess. And um, I'll say that, that that's about it. <coughs> Miami is ready, but uh, at the end, uh, and sorry to say, no, no most major carry wants to call Miami. I mean, they are. It's not because of anything. They are too far away from the, let's say, network rail network right. system of U.S. So you can call Miami with a big vessel, but then the connectivity to the right, hinterland right. Of, of, of US will be expensive. Right, so, right. so it's still uh, going to the point to make that major sense. Going to the point you raised before and, and Rogers raised too about the importance of port connectivity. Yeah, correct. Yeah. I want to point out, I mean, I think what we've been talking about right here is can the ports physically take the vessels in? And that's step one. If the port, if it can't arrive, then it doesn't matter. But uh, we also heard earlier, it's the speed with which you can offload that. So they have to have the capacity there to take the larger number of containers, the TUs, coming at that port than they're used to getting and having the ability to maintain that on property. And then the third part of being ready is the ability to process and get it off property quickly. Because otherwise, if it backs up on property, you don't have customs clearance quickly, you don't have the infrastructure to move it, connect it off of that property, as you said, rail from Miami, sort of an indirect route going north, the, the problem you have is that it backs up and it doesn't matter if the vessel can arrive, it's going to be stuck there. Yeah. And, I, and this is actually a little known fact. This is how DHL started. The H of DHL, Larry Hillbloom, was doing a project um, at business school in San Francisco, in the port of San Francisco in 1969, and saw all the maritime vessels backed up, waiting to clear customs. And he told the port, give me the paperwork, I'll fly to Hawaii, I'll meet the vessel, they'll come in with the paperwork all clear and they'll expedite the release. Huh. That is the birth of the courier industry, really to facilitate maritime trade. And that's where, if you really want to see this uh, efficiencies from the larger vessels, it's going to have to not just deal with the port um, dredged infrastructure, it's the port infrastructure itself, and it's the connectivity off-site with customs. Otherwise, any one choke point can slow down the ability of the of the port to take the goods. Yeah, I want to get to, sir. I want to get to your question. If you could please just give your, your name and, and affiliation, and uh, we'll take your two questions together, and then we'll go back to the panel and go. And there's a after you, after you two people down, she has a question as well. Uh, Henry Hatker, retired federal government researcher at National Archives. Uh, I wondered if you're familiar with the uh, so-called Yokohama to Boston route uh, via the Arctic uh, due to climate change. Uh, the ice is receding. Uh, quite rapidly, and in time, this may become a reality. It's still on the drawing boards. However, uh, it's been indicated, I think, by Mr. Benedetti that there's something like 4 million tons a day currently uh, in trade uh, in these containers uh, that, that are coming through, uh, and it's greatly increasing. So there appears to be plenty of trade in the future, and even if such a route does you know, come off the drawing boards and becomes something in reality, uh, mm -hmm. there would still be plenty of uh, trade going via the route that you have now, uh, I would think. Any comments? Great, great. We'll, take the, we'll take her question as well. Thank you for um, organizing the panel. Um, I was just can reading... Give me, can you give your name and affiliation, please? Sorry, yes. Yeah, Susana Carrillo from the World Bank. Um, I was reading this morning an analysis on how climate change, especially the El Nino current, is going to influence, influence the water. It's going to have an effect on water levels in Panama. Yeah. And that will hinder 
the uh, access of big ships. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there are any risk mitigating measures mm -hmm. that are, have been put in place. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Two excellent questions with a common thread of climate change. Um, yeah. Bob, you want to start? Okay. The, the question, her question about uh, the, the rising sea levels and, and, and how the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the Panama yeah. Canal, yeah. Okay, uh, in terms of the El Niño phenomenon, that's something that happens and it happens this sometimes every few years. Actually, we just uh, announced that we will be having draft restrictions starting April 18. Instead of offering a draft of 39 and a half, it will be uh, just 39. And that has an impact on the amount of cargo that the ships ha can handle. Uh, what we're looking at right now is that it may start raining by May. And we are crossing our fingers, and we have our meteorologists looking at this. It's something that it's a nature, happens with nature. We have been through this before. And actually, in October last year, we were forecasting that El Nillo will make us put draft restrictions. Thank God it rained in Panama. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have to do it. Uh, but it's something that happens. In terms of the Arctic, we have been looking more at the uh, Northwest Passage uh, mm -hmm. over Canada, because that's what will impact us. Uh, they will be able to be open like 100 days a year. In order to go there, a uh, ship needs to have an icebreaker, and that makes the cost of the ship and the insurance a lot higher. Mm. We don't see it, you know, like a permanent route that could be a threat to the Panama Canal. In addition, our main uh, business is container shipping. About 50% or more of our revenue come from containers. And these container ships, they have to follow itineraries in which they leave cargo in several ports. Nobody's going to be leaving cargo in the Arctic, really. So it's not something <laughs> that, we, that we are concerned about. Uh -huh. The other thing, and it's very interesting to look at, is, for example, all that entails to rescue a ship that gets grounded there. It's very expensive. I don't remember how many miles away is the nearest station that they call in order to save mm -hmm. a ship. So there are many, many uh, restrictions for that. For the route that goes over Russia, I know that Costco put a, a ship and that they were successful. And uh, we didn't see it. You know, it's not within our area of influence. Yeah. Thank yeah. God. <laughs> And, 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 I, I was, yeah, like please, please. To the Arctic. Uh, when all the Arctic issue was, uh, uh, let's say, building up to be really analyzed, uh, we need to take into consideration that cost of the service was really high. We, we, uh, shipping lines were dealing with uh, $800 per ton bunkers. So they were looking to alternatives to save cost. Now at 200 with oil really down, it doesn't really make that much sense. Mm -hmm. But other than that, uh, we need to take into consideration that uh, even Maersk Line, the largest container carrier in the world, has ordered the construction of 20 container carrying submarines. So I mean, technology continues to advance. Yeah. And so they don't need, they don't, they, they wouldn't really care if there is ice or no ice, they'll just go underwater. Underwater, yeah. so, so it's interesting to follow. Yeah. And just to add something, I, am, I don't want to say that the Arctic is not important. It's a huge source of minerals, and there are companies that are exploiting minerals there. So, right. so it, it's not winning our business, but it's, it's important. Right, right, right. Yeah. So it's going uh, yeah, please, yeah, Roger, jump in. Just also that as DHL, like every, every company that's uh, not particularly non-vessel operating common carriers, is looking at any routes which are economically feasible. So we'll look at any route. But I think in the more medium term, the, the greater interest will be, uh, as you said, minerals uh, and uh, oil that is collected up there yes. and then transported out. So it's less the transit route and more of a destination for uh, mm -hmm. whatever, depending upon the type yeah. of energy production that's done uh, in that region, because it will open up energy production capabilities yeah. and, a, and a race. Although the one thing that will have to be 
always taken into consideration is safety and security, yeah. being able to operate. Excellent point. I want, I want to switch over to, to the public-private partnerships and the role of public-private partnerships in, in, uh, in helping to improve critical infrastructure uh, needs. And um, with that, Hajimi, you, you and, and, and JICA specifically, as a significant amount of experience advancing PPPs um, globally, really, uh, including uh, my understanding is very much involved in the recent development in the uh, Mombasa port in, in Kenya. What, what do you, what do you, from your perspective, and and, uh, and you've worked extensively on uh, financing uh, of projects across across the region. What do you see as the greatest opportunities for public-private partnerships in transport infrastructure? And we can we can feel free to move beyond ports um, because as we <laughs> as we've talked about, uh, the the ports are critical, but so is the infrastructure that connects those ports. Yes. Well, uh, yes, we have been financing or preparing those kind of PPP project. Well, but when it comes to that Mombasa example, uh, actually, I checked uh, our Kenya office, uh, what's going on. <laughs> and it seems like, uh, well, the construction already finished, but they are having a difficulty in uh, finding out the operator, uh, which shows that the difficulty of the PPP project. But anyway, uh, I think uh, well, the PPP, well, if, uh, like the case of Panama or the case of Cartagena, if the private company have the interest and if they see uh, the sufficient uh, profitability, viability, then uh, we don't have to take, in, take part in that kind of project. But there are so many projects that uh, the idea exists, demand exists, but it is a little bit far from the actual implementation in, with the private uh, company. Uh, for example, in often cases, they don't have a concrete study, uh, basic design or feasibility study. And uh, that part is, uh, it costs. And usually government doesn't have enough capacity to do that, I mean, technically or financially. So that part we can assist by technical assistance. And uh, other than that, uh, sometimes uh, the, the government side doesn't have enough capability of doing that project. In that case, we will provide a specialist to assist uh, the technical development assistance. And also, when it comes to the finance, uh, there are some projects that uh, definitely need some kind of additional finance. It's not viable. In that case, if the government wishes, uh, we can provide kind of viability gap financing, uh, which means that if the project itself uh, cannot generate enough uh, funding for or the whole repayment, we can finance the space. Or if the government would like to create uh, one uh, vehicle of the special uh, purpose company for the PPP project, and they need some kind of financing, we can back finance for that. Mm. And uh, finally, uh, we can provide some kind of uh, uh, standby financing that if those agreement uh, was made, but uh, eventually it couldn't materialize, we can finance, like it's like a security, but uh, it's through uh, the loan financing. So for those kind of uh, mechanisms uh, we'd like to use uh, in order to materialize those PPP projects. And uh, well, uh, port is, of course, very important. It's the entry of the trade. But uh, not only the port can materialize the development of the country. My concern is the development of the country. Mm -hmm. So where uh, the exporting goods uh, comes from the rural area of the country. So the internal road is also important. And they are not usually uh, viable. They cannot provide, I mean, we cannot construct toll road for the rural project. Right. So in that case, maybe we have to finance entirely. And also. Uh, yeah, like uh, uh, Roger uh, suggested, there might be uh, some kind of problem of the uh, customs. In that case, we can provide uh, technical assistance for the customs. So in that way, we can provide a whole package of assistance and uh, technical assistance and also financial assistance to materialize or uh, to build up this kind of and, uh, movement. Jimmy, let me ask you, what, what do you see as the, the secret sauce? You know, what, what makes, from your perspective, what makes a public-private partnership successful? I mean, you've, you've, you've outlined a few different ways in which those partnerships could work, but yeah. what, what's uh, yeah, the key yeah. for- Actually, I, I ask the same kind of question to the private people several times. <laughs> okay, but we'll, 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 we'll flip it to the private people afterwards. Yeah, so. all the cases, the answer is almost the same. It's a gut of the, <laughs> that country. If uh, there is a person who really has the guts to materialize these things, it is a really, really single most important thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if uh, such kind of political will moves that way and that way, it will not materialize. So let's, let's turn this to let's, let's let's turn this to the other panelists then. Um, you know, Giovanni, the the, uh, the the port of Cartagena has done a, a impressive job attracting a, a 
uh, private financing for for its upgrades. What, from your perspective, what do you look for in a, in a partner to uh, uh, to when you when you when you're deciding who you want to uh, work with on a in a potential partnership? Well, for example, uh, Hajim yeah. is outlining here. Yeah, but 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 maybe coming. Uh, we have been engaging one APP in Colombia, and uh, uh, it was regarding the access canal to the Cartagena Bay because. By law, is, is, there is, is the obligation of the government of Colombia to fund and make the canal. But if, if we started waiting for them to fund it, then we'll have missed the opportunity of the new vessel. So we decided to engage with them, prepay, put together the opening of the canal. And now we are with them working in a second access canal. We don't want to rely only on one canal, but on the second canal. We, we, we follow. We don't get involved in highways, but uh, highway uh, financing via Private Partnership Association has been uh, rather uh, successful in Colombia. And now we're following, talking again about connectivity, we, we are developing a river port 500 uh, miles up the Magdalena River. And uh, yeah, we can do the, the, the terminal, we can have barges there, but uh, if, if, if the Colombian government doesn't find a way to make the Magdalena River uh, available to, 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 to sustain navigation 24-7 all year round, we're doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, now they were engaged with, uh, regrettably, with other brick. Uh, yeah. And now, due to all these scandals, right, they are reviewing right. what to do with, the, uh, uh, with all that dredging of the Magdalena River. But uh, it's part of, uh, of the interest, not only uh, of the port, but of the country. I mean, we're talking about cheaper connectivity between the inland and the ports to make a lot, a lot of products of Colombia that cannot compete today in the world market due to uh, very, very high hinterland cost to the ports. Mm -hmm. I want to ask Roger to answer that too. And then th think through your questions. Raise your hands if you have questions here. I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to answer everyone's questions uh, uh, around the table. But Roger, from your perspective, we'll get to your question after Roger answers this. So Roger, from your perspective, uh, what, what is, what is, what is, how does DHL work with the government to create an investment environment um, that's, that, uh, that works for sustainable transport and infrastructure. Well, and I think that's, you just added the word right there that I think is really important to keep in mind, sustainability. And it ties back to what we said a minute ago about viability. Why is it that the poor projects can move forward with and attract private financing? Well, first of all, they have volume. Second of all, they have a funding stream. If you have revenue source, you can oftentimes attract private investments. Toll roads can attract private investment, but a non-toll road, very difficult to do that. Right. And in airport projects, for example, uh, U.S. restrictions on, uh, they keep saying they want to bring in private investment on airport projects, but U.S. has restrictions that you can't have any of the monies raised on property leave property. It was originally designed to try to help prevent a local community using airport revenues to pay for the transit system. But it's also today prevented any investor from being able to take money back out. So there's no incentive to invest in an airport system if you're going to put money in and you cannot take money out. So you have to look at any viability of it, a P3 has to have this enough volume through it. You can't do it in a rural community, but it also has to have a, a funding stream to attract the private investments. And that's going to be a challenge. The, the big part here that I think uh, I, I heard Hajime raise, which I think is important, is political will. Yeah. Because there yeah. are times when it's not necessarily a, a funding issue. It is a political decision of a community, particularly when you're dealing with sustainability and urban planning for smart cities. Cities throughout Latin America, the, the emergence of mega cities in Santiago, Chile, and Mexico City, and, and elsewhere, where the infrastructure is collapsing under the size of the city. It requires political will to look at how we can balance the movement of people and the movement of goods in a way that's efficient, that leverages not just physical connectivity of intermodal connections, but digital connectivity. The shared economy has a great capacity to bring in optimization in ways for the movement of people that we've never looked at in the past. And that's a way to reduce the burden on existing infrastructure. So, I think that political will yeah. really needs to be, to be put forefront. Access to capital is good. It needs to have funding. But without political will, the, the funding is not irrelevant, but it's, a, it's an afterthought. And I probably add not only political will in the short term, but also the guarantee of longer term yeah. political will, which is, which is always the big, the big challenge. Uh, question back there, yes. 
Thank you. Alex Sanchez, right now and then for James Defense Weekly. Uh, my question is actually for Giovanni. You talked about the expansion of the, uh, of the Cartagena port, with the, with the port in the river. How is your um, company or organization dealing with climate change? Right now, like we talked about El Nino, there's a major drought in Colombia. Both the Magdalena River and the Cauca River have dried out. There are places where you can actually cross them just by walking. In one company, Ecopetrol has complained that because of the drought, they cannot transport oil from Barranca Bermeja to Cartagena. So I'm all for, you know, protecting, expanding infrastructure, but how do you deal with, the, with this new world that we're, in, that we're facing right now where, you know, it may just not rain and it, you, you may just have a dried up river, then what do you do with the port that you just constructed? Thank you. Yes. Uh First of all, uh, you're correct. We are facing the most severe drought, perhaps, in Colombia in the last 80 years. This is not, let's say, typical, but uh, it, is, it, it is an issue. Secondly, I'll tell you that when we decided where to locate our port, we went back for 100 years of history about levels of the rivers. And the place that we selected, that is not too far away from the Barranca Bermeja uh, 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 refinery, it's about uh, 80 kilometers away, we selected that particular place because we, under severe circumstances, could most probably ensure navigation at least for 10 uh, months per year. Even today, as severe the drought it is, we're still having opportunity to, to serve uh, uh, the system. Um, of course, when, when, when we talk about river systems, we need to educate our rivers. And, uh, that's something that, let's say, the Mississippi uh, has been doing for, for many, 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 many centuries. And this is something that is only starting in Colombia to be done. In the way, the Magdalena is, despite, uh, uh, despite what you say about the severe drought, it still uh, holds a lot of water. The need that you need to educate it and need to perhaps uh, do some dredging options and do some canals in some parts to ensure navigation all year round. That's part of what we're working on. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Daniel Becker, visiting scholar at the George Washington University. My question concerns China presence in Latin America and infrastructure use. Um, do you think that China has had a big impact in your business? Do you think that China's contribution to infrastructure in Latin America will also impact in your business? It means that maybe the Nicar uh, Nicaragua uh, Canal would have an impact. But maybe it's just a dream or a nightmare. What do you think about it? <laughs> okay. thanks, thanks, for, thanks for bringing that up. OK. Um, well, in Panama, we don't see a lot of Chinese investment, uh, primarily because we have relations with Taiwan. That's, that's something that we haven't changed. Uh, the Nicaraguan Canal uh, is a project that has been presented by an investor, a Chinese investor. His name is Wang Jin, uh, and he was given a concession to develop this canal and other areas of Nicaragua. Uh, they were supposed to start working, I believe it was last year. Up to this time, we haven't seen any progress in the project. We do know that uh, this investor, he lost about 90% of his fortune with the Beijing market fall. He will have to get funding from other people. Uh, we haven't seen environmental studies. We haven't seen any earth movements. We have seen an interest to building a port. Uh, we, we are following on on this, but Nicaragua and its canal have always been on the table. And if we go back in history, back in 1914, when the US decided to build the canal in Panama, the canal was actually going to be built in Nicaragua. A very shrewd businessman called Bruno Varilla, who had a big stake in the French canal, the mm. French tried to build a canal in Panama before, and they went bankrupt. He tried to stop this. And he did it sending to several Congress people in the US a stamp with the Momotombo uh, volcano in eruption. The reason is that they don't have the land conditions that we have. 
They are prompt uh, to earthquakes. Panama is not prompt to earthquakes. They are in the, this vol volcano ring. Uh, it's a dream that they have always been pursuing and we do right. Uh, but we, we keep looking at it and we don't see any progress on it so far. It's a $50 billion project, according to them. According to our projections, it's going to be $70 billion. If you want to recover the investment, it's going to be very hard. In Panama, uh, we will be recovering our $5 billion, and we have a proven canal that we have been managing for several years, for a, over 100 years. Um, what can I tell you? It's something that we will have to see it you know, being made in order to, to really take it uh, seriously. So, so uh, maybe, maybe to sum up your answer, um, I know you wouldn't say this, but I will. A, 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 <laughs> you see, it's, it's a pipe dream still. Um, it, it, it could be, you know, it, it could be. Now, this is the first time that they do have an investor. And that's what called our attention when they came up with the project in 2014. Mm. Uh, but the investor is not really, uh, uh, it's not as financially sound as he was. Uh, if you look at the terms of the contract, and I encourage you to do it, it's really worrisome for Nicaraguans. There is opposition in Nicaragua. The first page, it states that this is a contract between HKND, that's the Hong Kong-based company, and the Nicaraguan state or its su successor. So it's really something that is hitting on their sovereignty as a nation. Does any, any other panelists, before I go to, so you have a question before going to your question, anyone, any other panelists want to comment on the, the broader question about China's presence in the region and so far as infrastructure um, development? If not, I, I want to add something, yeah. and maybe Washington is a good place to say it. Uh, so, back great, I'm sure it's a great place to say <laughs> it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's, a great pla it's a great place because uh, back in 1998, Panama, uh, the government of Panama gave a concession to Hutchison, and they operate the port in Balboa, which is in the uh, Pacific area of the canal. At that time, one of the presidential candidates of the US today uh, said that uh, Nica, uh, Chinese, the Chinese were taking control of Panama and of the canal. That's not true. Actually, they are managing a port in the entrance of the canal in the Pacific, as they do in many other countries. And sometimes I get this question in by US groups, mm -hmm, many people mm -hmm. who are in government uh, sectors, and I just wanted to clarify it in, just in case. Yeah. Any other comments on China's presence? If not, we'll go. I can just add that uh, in Colombia, they're not really active. Uh, in several Caribbean islands, they are really, really active, I can say. Um, perhaps another view on the uh, Nicaragua uh, Canal. We, we don't see it uh, as a business. And, uh, and if this is going to happen, what we believe is that they are putting like a middleman, an investor. But uh, if this is going to happen, it's actually the Chinese government getting really involved. And it's yes. like having a license yes. to have a Chinese province in Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Yes. Mm -hmm. The canal is an excuse at the end of the day. Yeah. And it's everything that could happen, I don't know, in over half a million hectares that are to be concessioned. Mm -hmm. So it's, you need to think it from the geopolitical and economical yeah. perspective, not yeah. from building a canal and operating an economically issue. And, and yeah. that's the only way that we see that it can really come through. If the China decides to help with the funding uh, and put a canal in Nicaragua. Okay. Correct. So your question over there. Uh, thank you to the panel. My name is Frank. I'm with CGLA Infrastructure. Um, my question is very broad. Uh, I mean, obviously, the Panama Canal has got a huge driver for a lot of projects in the region. Um, but you know, what are some other perhaps trends that we haven't really uh, discussed today? So for, for example, there's you know, kind of political transition in Argentina, Cuba, uh, Brazil's having a you know a little bit of a hard time, so maybe they might be slowing down. But you know, maybe oil, PPPs, LNG. What are some other trends that haven't really raised at this point? You know, Cuba is interesting. Uh, they could become a very big transshipment hub, uh, the <coughs> Port of Mariel, actually. Mm -hmm. And they are very near the US, and they will have a very low um, manufacturing cost. So that's something that we, we need to be following on. 
uh, because it's, it's something that that well, my understanding would make Mariel, a change. My understanding is, is the Cubans, I mean, they've constructed the Mariel port and the special economic zone specifically to be a hub as a critical kind of transshipment port. That's part yeah. of one of the, the things yes. they're, they're at least they're trying to do. I see. Do you I, 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 see, I, see, I, see. I, don't, I don't really see it as a hub. I mean, it's way too <laughs> far north and west. But uh, what I do see is that uh, they're trying to put together. Yeah, of course. Uh, Cuba needs a new port, the old port of Havana. What is that happening? They're closing Havana, moving to a new modern port. Of course, they, they're, it's going to grow. But uh, the way that I see it is that uh, if you think about near sourcing and near shoring, Cuba has kind of a well-educated people, very, very, very low salaries. So Cuba can be, to some extent, the, the new Mexico. I mean, Mexico yes. has been receiving lots and lots and lots of uh, investment of new uh, 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 manufacturing, especially in the car, segment. the car segment. But if you go to apparel, you go to electronics, whatever, mm -hmm. Cuba can be, I mean, very close, yeah. high value cargo, very highly educated people, very, very cheap labor, so it can be a new near yes. sourcing, near shoring port. Yeah. That's the way that I see it. And yeah. of course, it will bring, yeah. bring trade, but not as a huge hub as they say. It will make more sense that now the Chinese are looking, it's Santiago de Cuba that mm -hmm. is in a much better geographical position, and that, that's to follow. Roger, you want to jump in there? Yeah, I mean, near sourcing or near shoring is not really a new topic, but at the same time, it's one that seems to go in and out of popularity at various times. Right now, it's actually uh, still has a great potential. And I think some of the changes on the, going back to Mexico, the US-Mexican border, and how they're dealing with pre-inspection or pre-clearance, uh, and if we can make some other changes on how um, Mexico handles some of their efficiencies, they put some restrictions on express delivery shipments, you know, how big can it be to still be considered express or how heavy the truck can be. If they can work on that and the IT systems connect, you can really see uh, that nearshoring promoting sort of cross-business trends with this uh, LTL trucking and cross-business development. As far as Cuba, uh, I would say they, they might have, let's assume for a second, they have the uh, ever important political will because that has to be there. Um, you can have the best infrastructure in terms of physical infrastructure, but I keep going back to this. Connectivity is more than just physical connectivity. It, it also involves connectivity of data. And how quickly is Cuba going to be able to invest in their IT infrastructure and the sanctity and security of that IT infrastructure? It's also going to be financial connectivity, the ability to move funds and have certainty about the transfer of funds that they're going to be there. And then it's also the free movement of persons. You know, DHL does connectivity index every year and they look around the world where's the most connected uh, places. I think a comparable to Cuba would be Singapore. Singapore is one of the leading, if not the leading, it depends on the year, con connected cities or city states in the world because they have free flow of data, free flow of people, free flow of finances, free flow of goods. If you could replicate that in Cuba, it would be really strong. But what I'm seeing today is just the beginning stages of this, yes. uh, we have to see a lot of changes occur in your confidence in the safety, security, and sanctity of all of those connectivities in order to really say this could become a logistics hub. Yeah. So uh, Cuba? Yeah, please, Hajimi, and then we'll go to your question, sir. Okay. Yes, uh, for Japanese government, also Cuba is a very imp interesting uh, country. And uh, from the point, viewpoint of uh, our financer, uh, maybe uh, right now the mo most difficult thing in Cuba is how to secure the foreign exchange. And right now, Cuban government has a difficulty in repayment. And so if uh, they would like to do some kind of investment for the infrastructure, like a port or somewhere, the, that project itself should be a financially viable, or uh, the government will receive a very long-term concessional loan. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's a little bit difficult for just ask private uh, sector to come in and do something, or uh, the private uh, company in Cuba to do something by their own. So uh, it's not so e uh, easy situation, and considering that uh, Cuba is not at this moment uh, uh, capable of receiving any loan from the World Bank or the IDB. Mm -hmm. So those are the in impediment, I think, uh, for Cuba at this moment. And, and that's something that we here at the Atlanta Council have been uh, uh, talking extensively is the uh, importance of uh, integrating Cuba into the international financial institutions. Um, 
And one thing that's changed through the presence of multiple rounds of executive actions on Cuba, which I think will make Cuba more competitive on, on the shipping front, is that beforehand uh, the embargo prohibited ships that docked in Cuba from them docking within the United States. Within, I think it was six months, you had to wait before you came to a, you, you may you may call it U.S. port. That's no longer the case, and so now a ship can go to Cuba and then it can it can go to a U.S. port afterwards through the uh, uh, executive actions taken by President Obama. Uh, sir, your question, and this might be actually the last question. Thank you very much. My name is Rick Rybeck. I'm with Just Economics. And uh, you asked a question, you know, what's the secret sauce for infrastructure projects? And I think the answer was, well, you need a source of revenue, of a funding, source of funding. And uh, it's been mentioned that user fees, like tolls, uh, can provide a source of revenue. But one thing that's often overlooked is the fact that if we connected a, a new modern port with some inland uh, manufacturing area, uh, the value of commercial land would rise dramatically as a result of that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And the land next to the new highway interchange, uh, the, that value is not created by the person who's lucky or shrewd enough to own that land. It's created by the entities that have created the port and the highway facilities to, to create that connectivity. But Typically, that value ends up as a windfall to whoever owns the land. And I'm wondering to what extent uh, uh, Hajimi or others on the panel uh, look at what, are, what is called value capture. In other words, taking the increased land value created by infrastructure as a way to make that infrastructure self-financing. Hmm. Excellent question, Rick. Hajimi, would you, would yeah, you yeah. like to go ahead? Well, in our project, I don't think, uh, uh, at least in Latin America, we utilize such kind of mechanism. But usually, when we think about, say, a railway, it is really, really usual to think about those kind of land value up. Well, in Japan, usually railway has uh, its own land alongside of the uh, railway. And uh, they know where to put the station so they, so they can uh, develop that sta uh, station area. But without such kind of development, uh, the railway itself is not financially viable. So that's why we consider that it's a part of the railway business, and it is, how can I say, legitimate, or a, it is a good model. So maybe we can say the same thing for the uh, uh, railway project in uh, some other country. Anyone else? Yeah, Roger. Yeah, just, um, I, I can't speak to how this would happen in a port context, but thinking in a much more personal context, when you're looking at uh, transit hubs in an urban environment, uh, there's a good example. There's some good examples here in Northern Virginia where the land around the metro station was owned by the metro. They had a large, very flat parking lot. They sold a large component of that or gave a large component of that land to a private developer in exchange for that developer building in substantial new multi-tiered uh, parking and bus connections. So the transit system exchanged the value of land in favor of the value of an efficient intermodal connection hub of cars, bus, and rail. And the developer had the attraction of being able to now bring in apartments and other facilities nearby that he can then sell off. So it, I don't know how you could apply that in maybe a port context, but at least in, in a smaller airport uh, uh, rail connections, uh, there's an ability of a public entity owning land being able to trade some of the valuable land in exchange for the work. Um, that, that has some limitations though because, uh, as I said, ports might be different and airports, people do complain when planes are flying overhead all the time, so right. maybe transit's <laughs> a better option. Uh, well, with that, I want to, again, thank Roger, Hajimi, Marianella, and Giovanni for uh, joining us today, especially Marinella from coming up from Panama and Giovanni coming up from, from Cartagena during, during Holy Week to be with us. Uh, I also want to thank Thomas Corgan who's standing right there. Thomas is the, he's the champion on our team for infrastructure issues. It's actually because of him and his, his pushing us over the last year or so that we're now starting an infrastructure initiative and this conversation is the first of that. And uh, obviously given the richness of the conversation and the continued questions that I'm sure are there around the table, uh, we will obviously be having more of these discussions. So thank you again, everyone, for, for joining us today. And I'm sure the panels will stick around for a few minutes afterwards for, for additional questions. Thank you.